Welcome to Mobile Communications Chapter 4, a really big chapter about wireless telecommunication systems, cellular networks, mobile phone networks, whatever you call it. I will briefly go through markets for this because the market is really the driving factor for those mobile communication systems. We all want to have a mobile phone, cellular phone. We use it for many, many different purposes. There's a lot of money behind it. Then I will go through second generation systems, the most successful one, GSM and Tetra, a trunk radio system for police, for example, ambulances, etc. Then third generation systems, example, UMTS. Then fourth generation, LTE and LTE Advanced. And the fifth generation, sixth generations, they are in the outlook of the lecture. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of market and statistics. Going back to 1998, the first instance of this course, I have to say we were all wrong. This is one of the first graphs I showed there many years ago uh, when I said, okay, there are different mobile phone systems like GSM, CDMA systems, PDC, some analog systems. And uh, we already saw there will be some third generation systems. And there were some predictions and the prediction said, okay, we are now somewhere uh, here at 1998 and maybe 2002 will have something like oh, not even a billion subscribers. We are all wrong because as you see here, the total number of wireless subscribers is way higher. And in 2004, so 16 years ago, we had 1.7 billion. Four years ago, we had 7.8 billion. So the number of subscriptions was already 2016 higher than the number of, well, unique humans who could have a subscription with a growth rate of almost 5% per year. So all those predictions were, quite simply, they were wrong. So mobile phone systems were way more successful than predicted. So what is the status today? So some current numbers from 2019, 2020. The total number of cellular connections shown here is now more than 10 billion with a growth rate of more than 7%. So why 10 billion? Well, read the fine print there. It says it includes cellular IoT. So it includes the devices for the Internet of Things. So there are many things included, not humans. Then if you look at the number of the unique mobile subscribers, that's about five point something billion humans acting as subscribers of mobile phone networks with a moderate growth rate. So these are the current figures. Then how much money is involved? If you look at the numbers on the lower left hand side, you see that the overall well, spending in wireless telecommunication is 844 billion US dollars. So that's quite a lot. But if you then compare worldwide voice, so voice that includes wireless and wired, and compare this with wireless data, you recognize, aha, that's almost, that's the same. So wireless data, telecom spending worldwide, is the same as worldwide voice telecom spending. Voice that includes fixed and wireless networks. So wireless data is the same. And we'll see in the future, we will have way more data generated by IoT devices by machines. So that's quite interesting because the number of humans, there's an upper limit, but machines, we can have many, many, many more devices in smart homes, smart cars, smart uh, airplanes, smart factories, smart cities, whatever, and whatever smart means in this context. 
Then on the right hand side, you see uh, statistics for smartphone shipments. So you see the curve flattens, it goes up and then it flattens somewhere here. Because to be honest, well, maybe you will have a new mobile phone every two, three years, but that's it. So we all have this high resolution retina displays and we have many, many different gadgets, uh, apps installed on the smartphones. But okay, that's it. So there's also a upper limit of apps we really need and most of the smartphones can handle this. And today the smartphones there are more and more cameras. So uh, high quality pictures is a interesting feature for the smartphones. Yes, you can still call someone, but okay. More interesting is, can you have all your apps there? Can you have all these uh, additional software installed. Can you have an uh, intelligent camera there for uh, selfies, for this and for that? Uh, so that's more important than calling someone. That's quite interesting, this change of the initial use of mobile phones compared to today's use. Okay, so we see, hmm, if you are an operator or manufacturer and you see this curve, you uh, can easily tell that, okay, selling more smartphones, maybe not. So the, this flattening of the curve is linked to the limited number of humans. Completely different when you think of Internet of Things. There are also some predictions, if they are right or wrong, we don't know, we will see. But there are some predictions that say, okay, 2025 will have something like 50 billion devices whatever it will be, 25 billion, 30 billion, way more than humans. Some more statistics. Let's look at the network operators. Here you can clearly see world leader China Mobile. Yeah, that's due to the population in China. Then Vodafone, then a company in India, etc. So these are the big network operators. But what is quite interesting to see is if you look at the operators and then ask yourself, oh, uh, are these, for example, interesting companies in terms of revenue? Do they make money? Should I invest whatever uh, money there as a shareholder, whatever? Then you have to look at the so-called ARPU, the average revenue per user. That's an interesting figure. And here, if you look at 2014, it was around $10 per month, but there was a negative growth rate. 2018, we were already down at $8.45. That means the companies make less and less money per user and month. So, and still the growth rate is negative. What does it mean? Although you might be one of the big, big, big operators, you do not really make a lot of money out of the single users. And to be honest, in the mobile market for these cellular mobile uh, networks, we see more or less the same effects we had some years ago for the fixed networks. Sooner or later, the network operators are nothing but, well, companies that deliver bits. And you do not really make a lot of money out of delivering bits. So you need some added value. And this is why everyone says content is king. So as long as you do not control the content, you're nothing but a bit pipe. So the bits are flowing through your network, but you cannot really make a lot of money out of the bits. And this is why you see all those operators offering these additional things like, well, watch TV, whatever TV means today, or watch some streams over my network. And then, oh, I don't charge for the bits, but there I charge you for the content, for this interesting movie, for these, uh, streaming, whatever uh, you like. So that's the idea. And we saw this for the fiber optics, for example. You will not make any money out of transferring bits. Well, a little bit of money, but not really big money. 
But if you charge for content, then you can make a lot of money. And this is the reason in fixed networks why the big content providers actually, well, install new fibers like Facebook and Amazon and not the telco operators. And the same things will happen also in the wireless networks. We'll see the content providers they make money. And this is why you have this close cooperation from uh, network operators and content providers, why some of the wireless network operators say, well, we will not charge for the bits if you download some music or some movie, because they know they will get their money from the content providers. So it's interesting, this change in the market. And maybe you remember several years ago, you had to pay a lot for the bits you transmit. But bits, who cares? Usually today you have flat rates. Whatever flat means, that's not really fully flat at the maximum data rate, but at a decent data rate, it's something like a flat rate. Okay, so the markets are really changing there. But this is a lecture about technology. So now let's go back to technology and I will give you an overview, overview of the different technologies. So. If you look back a bit in history of mobile telecommunication systems, you will see many, many acronyms. I know this is confusing, especially today. Today we live somewhere here in a world of uh, LTE and 5G, whatever it is. If you look back, you think is, oh, what, what is this? This is really confusing, many different technologies. So now let's look on uh, the left hand side, you see, multiple access technologies, CDMA, TDMA, FDMA, classical schemes. And on the x-axis, you see the different generations. Well, to be honest, the generations have been introduced when uh, we had the first third generation systems. Then looking back from the third generation, uh, people said, okay, the old system is the second generation. We had something in between and the really old, old system. Yeah, this maybe was the first generation. And then starting from 3G, we started to have 3.9G, 4G, 5G, etc. So going back in history, it started with classical FDMA schemes. Why frequency division multiplexing? Well, those initial technologies were analog systems. And for analog systems, it's more complicated to do the time division multiplexing. So you use different frequencies, different carrier frequencies. And uh, there we have cordless telephone systems like CT0, CT1, or the advanced mobile phone system, AMS, or uh, the northern mobile telecommunications NMT system. Those were classical, today would say first generation analog systems. Then we had more processing power and everything went digital. So this was then the step from 1G to 2G. The second generation systems, they introduced digital voice. And this also means for many of the systems, we go from FDM to TDM. Yes, we all uh, we still have frequency division multiplexing. We still have channels, but here I mean we now separate users in time. The most prominent one is GSM. That's the most successful one, and I will go into details for GSM. GSM satellization starting in the early 80s, the first products early 90s of the last century. We had many other systems. So the Pacific Digital Seller, PDC, a digital AMPS version, IS-136, especially in the US, some other TDA, uh, TMA systems. At the same time, we had a competition using CDMA, IS-95, the standard there, and the product was called CDMA-1, IS-95, IS, that's for interim standard, IS-95 and CDM1 is the name of the product. Uh, CDMA technology, typically widespread in the US, South Korea, Mexico, Australia, and some other countries. GSM, 
technology used throughout Europe, many other countries. I will come back to the GSM. Then all these systems, they were mainly, well, geared towards voice communications. But sooner or later, well, companies uh, discovered, well, we maybe want to transfer more data. And the extension then was to introduce packet data additionally to circuit switching to GSM. And this is when we start with the GPRS system. So we will come back to GPRS, all the technologies later on. So GPRS adds packet switching to the classical circuit switching of GSM. So now we had, well, initially data rates up to something like 9.6 kilobit per second GPRS, maybe something like 20 to 30 kilobit per second, but now packet switching, way more flexible. I will explain why later on. Historically, then, a technology called Edge has been developed. Edge, enhanced data rates for global evolution, adds a new modulation scheme. GSM works on GMSK, as I introduced it already. Minimum shift keying and Edge adds 8PSK, so phase shift keying, another modulation scheme. And with the help of Edge, we could achieve higher data rates, up to several hundred kilobit per second. So today we call this generation 2.75. But industry didn't want to come out at the turn of the centuries, 2000, marketing was all geared towards UMTS, third generation. This is the internet in your mobile phone. The technology edge was already there, but this would have maybe killed UMTS because the data rates of edge were more or less the same compared to the initial UMTS. So where do we see UMTS here? Nowhere. <laughs> because UMTS was used in marketing, the universal mobile telecommunication system. I will come back to this in this chapter. In Japan, we had the marketing name FOMA. So that was marketing. The technical term for this is Ultra FDD WCDMA. Wow. So <laughs> that is UTRA is for Universal Terrestrial Radio Access. In earlier times it was called UMTS, but now it's Universal Terrestrial Radio Access. FTD means Frequency Division Duplex. You should know this. And the multiple access technology behind it is Wideband CDMA. So, but as you can see, this is only one member of a larger family of technologies for the third generation. And you can imagine there is no clear winner in terms of, well, this is the better technology, but different standardization bodies, different countries went for different technologies. I will come back to this when I uh, explain third generation technology. But for now, it's enough for you to know, okay, there are many different candidates for 3G systems. And if you follow the CDMA line, the history, well, CDMA 1, CDMA 2000, CDMA 2001X, EVDO, evolutionary data optimized. So there's also a CDMA technology optimized for data. But as you can also see, most of the 3G technologies go for CDMA. So they do not follow the FDMA, TDMA path, but they include CDMA. So 3G is heavily dominated by CDMA technology. So uh, in bold, you see the path we will follow in this lecture. This is where we have our UMTS, and then we have some add-ons like high-speed packet access. We have some other versions, uh, a synchronized version, time division SCDMA uh, that was proposed to China. And we have TDD schemes, 
not successful in the market. But as you see, we also have three G systems. They're not that well known, but still valid three G systems like digital enhanced cordless telephony, DECT. That's a cordless telephone standard that actually fulfills the criteria for 3G. And we still have it for cordless telephones. I will come back to what the criteria are, etc. So starting from GSM, also in the lecture, I will cover GSM, GPRS and Edge. Then I will go to UMTS, which is this Ultra FDD wideband CDMA. And after that, we will go to the 3.9G and then 4G systems LTE. And you will see, oops, we are back again in TDMA and FDMA system. Many scientists today think, well, CDMA, nice idea, but CDMA is, there's one person who actually said CDMA is for PhD thesis but not for real products. Yes, we have many products using CDMA, but the technology is more complex than expected. The efficiency is not as high as uh, expected. So the now more evolutionary path follows rather combination of TDMA and FDMA using a lot of OFDM. OFDM was this orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. So we will see that LTE splits time into time slots and frequencies into part of the spectrum and the combination of time slot and part of the spectrum then gives you the resource to transmit your data. So LTE was in marketing already a 4G system, which it is not because the data rate is not high enough, but today's LTE advanced is then a full 4G system. Okay, these are the system now really rolled out worldwide and starting already two, three years ago, but this year 2020 is the year we will see more and more 5G systems. And for 5G, we will not have a revolutionary, completely fancy new technology. No. The so-called 5G new radio actually is based on what we already have, uses different and new frequencies, a bit higher flexibility, using MIMO, using OFDM, but you also using beamforming. So you see the new radio, as this is called in 5G, is not a complete new revolution, like going from a TDMA to a CDMA system, GSM to UMTS, but it's rather an evolutionary path. So LTE, uh, you will learn that LTE is quite flexible. So in the future to come, we will see more and more versions of LTE, LTE advanced and whatever evolutionary path there will be and these will be our 4G 5G systems so 5G with a way lower latency latency so the delay between a mobile station and the base station will be in the millisecond range this is important for autonomous cars for example remote controlling systems we will see many more pico cells with the 5G systems we will see a more intelligent network and we already have at least some ideas where the sixth generation goes. So 6G, uh, there we include yet another buzzword. So artificial intelligence inside the network. So the core network will be more intelligent, more and more intelligent and can do some fancy things. I will explain this rather in the outlook because the picture is still a bit unclear how it will exactly look like. So we know how 5G looks like. The first products and devices are there, but it's not really that widespread and it's still in a kind of a uh, roll out experimental phase for when it comes to real applications. So this is the path through this jungle of acronyms and you see, well, okay, at least I can sort in the standards somehow. 
but if you then look at the standardization bodies and you look up standards for GSM, it's already thousands of pages. GPRS adds some other thousand pages. Adds, adds, adds some pages. UMTS, etc., etc. I will come back to this kind of rather jungle of standardization when I cover 3G systems to guide you at least a bit through this that if you want to look up something, you will find it and you will understand where you can find it. Additionally to these standards, you can always uh, add space division multiplexing. Beam forming is some kind of an SDMA technology. So there uh, I would say this is a bit SDMA because we can follow someone in space using the beams. Okay, so at least you should have a basic understanding of this development and understand after the whole chapter what most of the acronyms mean. So these are the generations. And remember, we started counting in generations when there was the third generation, then we looked back and looked a bit forward and defined the generations. So what happened over the years? So many, many press news. I just picked some news out of this many uh, because 12 years ago, uh, we passed the 3 billion subscriber mark. That was quite a lot. And that was uh, just 17 years after the first GSM network launch in 91. More than 700 operators, 200 18 countries and territories. Well, <laughs> look up the internet and Wikipedia what the definition of a country. There is no clear definition. So members of the United Nations or whatever. So many countries, territories around the world use it and a connection, new connections at a rate of 15 new subscribers per second. 15 new subscribers per second. That's quite a lot. 1.3 million per day. Well, a year later, just a year later, 4 billion connections. So that's quite a lot. Six years ago, many people, 80% of the world population had at least, at least access to broadband. And two years ago, we had more than 8.5 billion mobile connections, which you see the average revenue per user shrinking. Today we have to see the start of the 5G networks. We see the first 5G phones with different capabilities. Uh, as I said, this is still, I would say, some kind of experimental phase on the market. So where are the new applications? What can we do? And it's not about data rate. So the data rate of the <laughs> classical 4G LTE network, LTE Advanced, is quite high. It's rather lower latency. So the delay between your mobile phone and the base station should be lower. Okay, that's all about markets, figures, roughly structuring the field. Now this chapter is a big one. But after we finish the chapter, you should be able to answer the following questions. These are typical questions a kid could ask you. Your parents could ask you, every, everyone could ask you. You should be able to answer this. This is what I expect as a minimum. And you should be able to add some more technical content. So the basic question always is for all the systems, all the different generations, how does it work? And one basic question is how can the system locate me? Remember, GSM, for example, is a system that was in use before we had GPS localization, how can the system find me? Do we need satellites for this? No, definitely not. It works in buildings. We don't have satellite connection there. And if someone calls me, you should be able to answer the question, why don't all phones ring at the same time? How do we, well, separate, identify users? How do we separate them if two users talk simultaneously? Well, you know, multiplexing, but how is this done? Why don't I get the bill from my neighbor? Why can someone from some country as a tourist use the mobile phone in some other country? How does this 
work. And it works without, well, you as a user, you, you will not notice it. Can I simply overhear communication of others? Can I eavesdrop somehow? What about security? Is it secure? There will be no clear yes, no answer for this, as always. It depends. And then you should always be able to name the key components of the mobile phone network. No one expects from you that you know all the details. Because, as I already mentioned, the standards are really big. Really big. It's way too much. But you should be able to draw a simple picture of the architecture of the phone network and explain the key components, explain how it works on abstract level. But then if you have to go into detail, so what is the precise bit for emergency calls and on what channel is the base station transmitting this bit? Then you go into the standards, but you have to have a rough understanding of the architecture. So, some questions. Why do we have so many more connections compared to subscribers? And in this context, who or what is really driving mobile communications the future? Think back, the internet was dominated by workstations and universities many years ago. Then we had the web and then we had everyone using the internet. And who is today dominating the internet? Who is dominating the mobile phone networks? Hmm. What are consequences of this shrinking average revenue per user? What can companies do? Who actually defines these generations? Maybe you find this out. I will come back to this uh, later on when I discuss UMTS. So who actually says now this is a 4G system and this is a 3G system? Is there someone, some standardization body, some company, whatever? Uh, please uh, go to some of the statistic pages, check out the newest numbers. I know sometimes you will not get the newest numbers because you have to pay for it, but you will get some of these overview statistics. Go once more through the simple questions. Keep them in mind. These are the questions you have to be able to answer after we went through all the systems of this chapter.